Hey, speak for yourself, listeners. Before we start the show, I wanted to tell you about our brand new Fox Sports app and website, foxsports.com. Reimagine for the modern sports fan. Go ahead, download the new app now. You don't even have to pause this episode. Every day on the new app and website, you'll see the top stories in sports, plus a rich world of written content, videos, social media, and analytics to give you a 360-degree view of the most important stories of the day. Streaming live TV has never been so easy or elegant. Every Fox Sports game, including all pregame and postgame shows, are just one click away. For the extra invested fan, we also go deep with real-time wagering lines, trending prop bets, win probability, and key player projections. So download the new Fox Sports app or visit www.foxsports.com. Now, let's start the show. Welcome to Speak for Yourself. Marcellus Wiley, Acho is out today, so I'm on a solo mission. But we're going to keep it moving, starting in Green Bay. And Aaron Rodgers is having an MVP season with a league leading 33 touchdown passes, only four interceptions. That's nice. We all remember the controversial move when the Packers drafted Jordan Love in the first round. Well, Rodgers hasn't forgotten it either, and he appeared to take a shot at his team front office. Take a listen. When it comes to records, I love I love them and milestones. Like, I do take pride in them. I think they're more things you look back on when you're done playing. Um, I don't think I'm done uh, by any stretch of the imagination, even though some people may have thought so in the offseason. Look, I'm solo at the desk, but not solo on the show. Got to bring in former Packer and champion Fox NFL analyst Greg Jennings. So, Greg, you have an issue with your boy Aaron Rodgers taking a shot at your former team. Absolutely not. This is what he <laughs> does, man. Oh, we're Come going on. there. He's going he's gonna to always give you that subtle punch. If you, if you try him, he's going to try you. But, no, w- what he's saying is, this team didn't know that he was going to be playing at this level. They didn't know the, that the relationship, if you will, would have been what it is right now currently as it stands. And that is very, very good. Uh, both Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers have gotten along great. I didn't believe that that was going to be the case going into this um, because of what Aaron Rodgers provides, just his, his, his level of IQ and with a young quarterback or young head coach coming in, knowing how much you're going to have to defer. But Matt LaFleur has done a great job of holding his ground, but also understanding I have a future Hall of Famer. So I'm going to have to defer. I'm going to have to give and take. I'm going to have to allow this offense to become ours collectively. And that's why it's worked. Now, what he's talking about with some people not, Uh, believing that he was going to be where he is and what he is and play as long as he's going to play. Yes, the Packers drafted Jordan Love for various reasons. They didn't see him playing like this. They didn't even potentially see or they didn't. They had concerns possibly on will this relationship work, as I alluded to earlier, but more importantly, his age. And when we all understand that we can't all be Tom Brady, we can't all be LeBron James. And so you have to prepare for what it's going to be. And that is typically the end of the road for a lot of players that starts to get in their upper 30s. I'm with you there. I don't have a problem with him taking the shot at the Packers because the Packers took a shot at him. And their shot at him was direct. They drafted at his position. Not only drafted, but in the first round. Like when the family's just coming over to draft day and say, who do the Packers pick yet? Oh, they picked Jordan Love. Ain't he a quarterback? Yeah. Don't you play quarterback? Yeah. That's a direct shot. So Aaron taking a few months to take a subtle shot at the Packers organization, I don't have a problem with it. Because if you're Aaron Rodgers, you're like, look, the only reason you're going to take this directly is if you feel guilty. Because I'm making this a buck shot. It's for everybody. It's not a rifle shot where I'm directing that at one person in being specific. I'm just taking a shot at all those naysayers, all those who read my birth certificate and said I couldn't continue to play at a high level, all those in the organization that supported the Jordan Love drafting. That's who Aaron Rodgers is taking the shot at. Aaron Rodgers is taking the shot at me as well, somebody who was exaggerating his decline because of the numbers 
numbers specifically. But if you look at Aaron Rodgers in terms of rebound or whatever they were forecasting of him this year, uh, number one quarterback by pro football focus rankings. Uh, first in passer rating. Uh, first in passing touchdowns. So it sounds like the people in the organization are bad weathermen. They just can't predict the future. They don't know what's coming. But in terms of Aaron Rodgers being dominant, he's been that way, and it seems like he's still that way. Uh, and I'll add this. When you look at Aaron Rodgers and you look at what he's been able to do this year, He's provided everything that they wanted that they didn't believe he still could potentially do. They knew that mm. he, he had done it, mm. but could he still do it? The answer is yes. And so when you are playing at a high level, you have every bit to stand on to shoot any shot you want to shoot. And he has, he's taken his shot. And I don't mind it again, because if you want to stay, you better play. <laughs> and he is doing every bit of plan for this Green Bay Packers team. Hey, it's funny when you talk about having to hammer, the leverage. Uh, there was a couple times in my career where I had to hammer, and I knew it. Boy, you couldn't tell me nothing when I knew I had that hammer. And you got to swing it when you got the hammer because, trust me, when they have the hammer or when the rabbit got the gun, oh, they're going to make you pay for it. And Aaron Rodgers knows that. He knows that the writing was on the wall. He doesn't know who wrote it. He doesn't know why they were writing it, but they were writing on the wall, Aaron Rodgers is done. And Aaron Rodgers has seen this before, being a historian of the game. Watch Tom Brady back in 2014 when they drafted Jimmy Garoppolo. And Tom Brady was like, oh, really? Let me just take this Patriots organization to three more Super Bowls and win another MVP since y'all think I'm in decline. And these type of competitors, guys with this level of ego, this level of game and production, we're talking about some of the greats of all time. They don't want to hear that, that their career is over, not on their terms, but on your terms. And what were those terms? Just his age, basically. Like, his age was underlining every single critique that they had of Aaron Rodgers. But now, since he's out there balling, they have the good relationship. They're out there winning games again. Let's not forget they won 13 games last year or in an NFC championship game. He's now in a position where... He's the best that he's ever been in the red zone. 24 touchdowns, not a single interception. And the last four games, completing over 73% of his passes with 13 touchdowns. Dude, Aaron Rodgers is not only saying, y'all some fools for doubting me, but now he's making them look foolish for ever even considering putting somebody else in that position. Got to bring in somebody else to help out in this conversation. Fox NFL analyst Bucky Brooks. So, Bucky. You have an issue with Rodgers taking a shot at the Packers? Well, I mean, I do have an issue with him taking a shot because the only reason Jordan Love was drafted because he wasn't playing well up until this season. Mm. He, had, he had declined in terms of his completion percentage, his passer rating. So as a team, you have to begin to take steps to protect yourself if he doesn't turn it around. Now it's great that he's playing at an all-time level. He's back to being the Aaron Rodgers that all the Packer fans know and love. But if you're Brian Gutekunst, you have to make this move to protect the franchise. We all talk about the quarterback being the most important position on the field. You do not want to get caught without a quarterback. One of the reasons the Packers have consistently been title contenders, because there was a nice handoff from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers. What you didn't want to have happen was Aaron Rodgers to no one, and then you're floundering around trying to figure out who is going to be the next quarterback for our franchise. Mm. B Bucky, I, I would I would come back and say this. You you talk about his numbers being down, but when we look at Tom Brady, we look at some of these older quarterbacks that are older, and we look at their personnel that are around them. The first thing we allude to is, oh well, look at the personnel or the lack thereof. When we look at Aaron Rodgers, when he got the baton handed off to him, what he was able to walk into offensively as far as skill guys was a plethora of guys. He's always had that. And now when you have a young quarterback that can make guys around him better, do that for so long. I, be I believe that that kind of allows you to become a little crippled, a little complacent into pulling the trigger on getting more assets around him to say, you know what, we need assets around him to now help him continue to play at a high level. And that's what the Packers had not done. And they still haven't done that. And so this is why I say take your shot. Because it, even with the trade deadline, they didn't pull the trigger on another receiver. Do they need another receiver? Yes, they do. They need someone 
that can add to what he does well and help them in uh, in the offensive passing attack. They can't just depend on Devontae Adams to be that guy. MVS has been up and down. Has he made plays? Yes, but he's been up and down. L- Alan Lazard has been in and out of the lineup. So they don't have that other guy that Aaron Rodgers can t- turn and look to and say, okay, go get me a buck 50 or go get me 110 today. He's always had that extra guy. And so he's always performed with that extra guy. And now all of a sudden you take all these weapons away and expect him to just be spectacular. As you alluded to, they were still 13 and three. He Mm. still got it done. They did get to the NFC championship game. Yeah, it's crazy that the miscues of players are for the entire world to see. But the miscues of an organization and sometimes even coaches, oh, we get hush-hush on those situations and hush-hush in those moments. When you're Aaron Rodgers, you're looking at this organization like, hold on, dog, this can't be true. Over the last nine years, in the third round or higher, they've only drafted one wide receiver, and that's Ty Montgomery. In the last nine years, include no wide receivers in any round in the last two drafts. Just this draft that just passed, they could have taken wide receivers. Ten of the wide receivers that were taken in the draft that they passed up on have multiple touchdown receptions. We all know about Chase Claypool, but others. The point being, you don't even have to draft a wide receiver that high to get production. But Aaron Rodgers is sitting there saying, you want to draft high at my position when I have this high level of production? You you keep saying, Bucky, well, well, he was in decline and he fell to this level. What level was that? It's funny in the NFL, we can look at the same thing differently. You can look at someone's numbers and one could be for those numbers and one could be against those numbers. I give it to you like I felt it as a defensive end. We used to know that you had to climb up the mountain to get your money because if you were going down the mountain, obviously they weren't going to pay you. If you want to get 10 sacks in a three-year career, you could do it two ways. You could go one sack. Three sacks and six sacks. And you know what? That next year, they're going to be like, yo, we got to pay this dude. He's up and coming. But imagine if you come out your rookie year, have six sacks, then three sacks, and then one sack. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, we got to stay away from this dude. He's in decline. Ten sacks. Ten sacks. Both ten sacks. We look at Aaron Rodgers like his decline fell to a level where he still didn't give us top-level production. He was still producing at a top level, just at the bottom tier by his own standard. I understand this. You, you, you guys are two great guys. You guys are very affectionate. You guys are loving hard. <laughs> you guys are loving Aaron Rodgers hard. But I'm going to go and I'm going to break this down to you having spent some time in Green Bay and mm. kind of understanding the philosophy behind it. Because Greg was talking about the personnel and the talent. And I, I, I'm, gr- I'm, I'm so glad that Greg brought that up because I wanted to bring up the philosophy. So what happened, Greg, I think, was a second-round pick. He played along James Jones, who was a third-round pick. Donald Driver was there, who was a seventh-round pick. Mm. Jordy Nelson was a second-round pick. Randall Cobb was a second-round pick. Going all the way back to when I was there, they never thought that it was important enough to invest a first-round pick in the wide receiver because they believed they could develop them and the system would elevate the player's that played in the system. So that's why it's never been a high priority to go out and get a first-round pick. Now, when you look at Aaron Rodgers, and I'm saying, the completion percentage was down, the passer rating was down. Matt LaFleur is looking at this system that he's bringing over from Sean McVay, and he's saying, how did we elevate the quarterback that we had with the Rams, Jerry Goff? Oh, by having a dynamic running game, we would use play-action pass, bootleg and movement stuff, things that would make the game easy. So what they were trying to do was load up on that personnel, A.J. Dillon being a big back, to go with Aaron Jones and others to help Aaron Rodgers play as he got older to allow the system to take some of the load off of him. Now, he is playing great, but I can't fault Matt LaFleur and Brian Gutekus for saying, how can we win if our quarterback is in decline? Let's make sure that we have a system in place to elevate him when he beginning to fall back to the pack. Mm. Let me say this about about my guys uh, being drafted in the second round, myself, Jordy, and James Jones being drafted in the third round. When something works, when something has proven to be successful, it's easier to stick to that. But once you find out, oh, well, we missed here. It didn't work this year. It didn't work that year. Mm. Once you start finding out it doesn't work anymore or it hasn't worked in a minute, you better change some things up. And I get it. Yes. Were they thinking globally, meaning they're, they understand Aaron Rodgers is getting up in age. We want to support him. We want to establish a running game. I have zero qualms with that. 
But what Marcellus is saying is we you drafted all your receivers that were great and were good second round or lower. And now all of a sudden you want to go and grab a quarterback who who hasn't proven anything. You go you actually dra- trade up to go get him in the first round thinking that wait, I might be walking out the door sooner or later or my my level of play has declined mm. that drastically. Mm. I there was no reason and and again I was for them. I supported them in drafting Jordan Love because of that Mm. very reason, being prepared for if Aaron Rodgers does decide to leave, never was it because his play had fallen down down to the wayside. Mm. So now here's the thing, Greg, because I think you were there when Aaron first got there. Um, The thing about Aaron is no one knew that he was going to be the superstar that he was. And it took him about three preseasons to kind of shake the stench off of, hey, is he going to be a real player? So all of the conversation that we're hearing about Jordan Love, let's just pause a minute because it took the great number 12 a little bit to settle in. Maybe Jordan Love will pay it forward by playing great when Aaron Rodgers eventually passes the torch to him. Wait a minute. I thought Aaron Rodgers was supposed to go first overall in that draft, but he failed to 24th overall. And now, all of a sudden, we're going to rewrite history. Bucky going to put his glasses on. Look at the preseason numbers. Look at the preseason numbers when he was there. What the hell did that got to do with anything? Because the conversation wasn't that he was a sure thing. It wasn't. Go back. Do a little research. It's all right there for you. Wait a minute. Well, he failed in the draft because of attitude conversations that they had, which, in part, have come true. But. But come on, man, they had Brett Favre there who had a bad year once they drafted him. But after that, Brett Favre even rebounded. You can't put that all on some preseason numbers with Aaron Rodgers. This is a situation that as soon as Aaron Rodgers hit the ground, he hit it pretty fast and started to roll to the tune of winning the championship with Greg Jennings. Wait a minute. A 24th overall pick wins the Super Bowl in three years, and you think that's a slow pace? It took him three years to start. It took him three years to start. He didn't Just, start right away. He, uh, excuse me. If you were behind Brett oh, Favre. He's behind. <laughs> the hell? Thank you. Right. Thank you. He's right. behind right. Brett Favre. Right. You they, weren't gonna, you they were... drafted Jordan Love so they could slow cook him like some grits and then make a nice uh. breakfast meal up in Green Bay. They didn't get him to go right now unless your boy completely fell off. He hasn't fallen off, so he gets an opportunity to stay. But Marcellus, mm. competition is great for everybody. Yeah, Everyone I wins. like competition. At my the position, well. competition is great because we can rotate in. Hey, Wiley ain't getting his sacks, bring in the other D linemen. At quarterback, you ain't rotating. So how is the dude even going to develop? We're going to look at some more Bucky preseason numbers to see that Jordan Love is developing. Oh, let's stick him in there and give him the keys to the franchise. That's not how it worked, Bucky. This is a situation where they should win now they were 13 and 3 last year. Love this. Huh? You did this for Bruce Smith. Wait, you were disposed of wait a minute. Bruce Smith. Two things. It's the same thing. Two, two things. I needed those three years. Trust me, I needed those three years. <laughs> and in those three years, there was no pressure on Bruce Smith that Wiley was coming. That's a whole different situation. And I got to get my opportunities game by game. Where Jordan Love's not getting any of that seasoning. And that's rich seasoning you need to have the confidence to take the keys of a franchise from an all-timer and a future Hall of Famer. They needed a position player. They needed receivers. They're ready to win right now. They're one game away from the Super Bowl last year. And this year, there's no powerhouse NFC team that scares the Green Bay Packers. But if you look at it by the numbers, they got an undrafted guy starting at tight end and Robert Tanya, who's nice, but still undrafted. And their number two wide receiver, Alan Lazard, is undrafted as well. It's just crazy that they're going to make Aaron Rodgers go out there and try and cook with such few ingredients or at least premium ingredients like you think a franchise quarterback they, deserves. They, they, they had a guy in sights, but someone swiped him before they got there. Brandon Ayuk was the guy that they wanted. He was snatched up. I Sometimes just, you can't get the guy that you Bucky, want. They, there are at least 10 receivers in this draft who have multiple touchdowns. 10. You name one. I named one. There are eight others. They didn't even think about those other guys, but they wanted a bench rider in Jordan Love just to put some <laughs> pressure on the future Hall of Famer, isn't it? Coming up at the top of the hour, the Cowboys are last in the NFC least, but we'll tell you if they can still win that division. But first, Cam Newton is struggling in New England. We'll tell you if teams should be lining up to sign them next offseason. Next, speak for yourself. Hello, Hey, Speak for Yourself listeners, it's Charlotte Wilder here to tell you about my new podcast with Mark Titus called The People's Sports Podcast. 
It comes out every Thursday and Mark and I take one of the big stories of the week and then we go off on tangents you never saw coming. This might mean that we start talking about the Dodgers winning the World Series and end up wondering if Knicks fans deserve happiness or begin with LeBron's greatness and end up drafting our ultimate beer league softball team made up of old athletes. Whatever it is, the only rule of the show is that it has to be fun and funny because these days we can all use as many laughs as we can get. So check it out wherever you get your podcasts and come down weird sports rabbit holes with us. We can't wait to have you. Now, back to Speak for Yourself. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. New England is still in the playoff picture, but they have question marks at quarterback. Cam Newton is coming off the worst passer rating of his career on Sunday, and he has thrown more interceptions than touchdown passes this season. Cam is currently on a one-year deal and can become a free agent next offseason. So, Bucky, should teams be lining up to sign Cam Newton this offseason? I mean, it's hard to make a case that teams should be lining up to sign Cam Newton, but I think there's one team that should line up to sign him back, mm. and that would be the New England Patriots okay. because Cam Newton has been a good soldier for the Patriots. He hasn't had everything right around him. We can talk about the lack of weapons and those things, but I think what he has shown is he is willing to adapt and adopt the Patriot way. He has been outstanding when it comes to his leadership ability. He has tried to take on the weight of being a primary ball carrier there, and prior to the COVID situation, he was actually playing okay. Now, we don't know what the after effects <clears throat> and how He's dealing with that, but it has been up and down. But I will say this. He has tried his best to adopt and adapt to the way the Patriots want to play. And I think that is enough to bring him back, even if they draft someone else to be the future of the franchise. Yeah, I'm with you. I, when you say line up, it's like, what kind of line are we talking about? Like, one of them long-ass DMV lines? Like, hell no, nah, it ain't going to be like that. He had to play that well. But also, not a short line as you would expect. You ever go to Six Flags, as soon as it opens, you're like, yeah, I'm here first. Ain't nobody ever first to Six Flags. Somebody always beats you there. So it's a shorter line, but still there's a line. I think Cam Newton will have a short line, including the New England Patriots, which should be the priority for Cam Newton if he wants to re-sign because of the content continuity, learning in this playbook, going from chapter one and volume one deeper into those same chapters and same volumes if he has continuity. But think about what Cam Newton was asked to do by the football world this year. One, go out there and show that you're physically capable of finishing a season. Remember, that was the biggest question mark and in part why Cam Newton wasn't signed this offseason. COVID-related, obviously, people couldn't go around and touch him in terms of physicals and have the same transactions as normal, but also the question marks about his durability. He's answered that so far. And more importantly, can Cam Newton be accurate with the football consistently? We always talk about the one year he had with North Turner, which was an MVP candidate type of season. Halfway through, Cam Newton had his highest completion percentage. And also, he had won six games, only lost two. But then the injuries started to occur, and people started to get off the Cam Newton train. Well, he's answered that as well in terms of his accuracy. His second best completion percentage of his career right now, right at 67%. So if you got a healthy Cam Newton, and you have an accurate Cam Newton, all you need now is a Cam Newton to stay in your system with continuity. This year was interrupted because of COVID. And like you said, before COVID, Cam Newton was getting it in to the point where he reset the expectations of a franchise that we thought wasn't going to even be in playoff contention this year. They are now in part because of Cam Newton. Sometimes he plays excellent <clears throat> Seattle game. And then we can also see what he played a couple weeks ago against the Houston Texans. But they get the loss in those two great cam games and then you see him get a win but he doesn't look that great against the cardinals all things said all things considered yeah there should be a short line for cam newton at the front of that line new england patriots as much as i want to say yes because i enjoy cam newton he's a great personality he's a great mm. leader but the answer guys it's it's no <sighs> No, and it's it's quite simple. And the reason is, hmm. it's not because he's not able to complete passes. That's not it. It's not because he's not a great leader. No, it's because when you look at Cam Newton, the first thing that comes to mind that separates him or that did separate him from other quarterbacks in this league is his ability to use his legs. And we have not seen that Cam Newton surface at all this year. 
And I think that is going to be a detriment to him moving forward and teams making that decision on whether they pulled the plug on Cam Newton. It's not going to be, can we have him stand up in the pocket and just be a pocket passing quarterback? No, we don't want that because any most quarterbacks can are going to be asked to do that. But can you bring something that's unique, a unique skill set? What has always been a unique skill set of Cam Newton? His size and his ability to run and extend plays and beat you as a dual threat. A lot of people want to say, I want to be a pocket passing quarterback, but don't ever forget what allows you to be so special. Don't ever forget the skill set that allows you to rise above everyone else. And that has always been his ability to use his legs. And that is no more Cam Newton that we've seen this year. And Marcellus, when you start to pick as players and, and as coaches, when you start to pick out specific games and plays Chill. that guys have had, well, Chill. it's it, it, that's that's a telltale sign that uh, is it going to be consistent or am I going to get it sometimes and sometimes not? At this position, I need it every single game wow. down in and down out. Wow. Uh, you uh, went there. You went there, huh? Okay. Greg, you act like you didn't come down the hill in decline. Well, you didn't. Not as steep as I did. So I know about what to look for <laughs> when you see a player in decline. And Cam Newton is not in decline as much as he's in interruption. And that's where he is in this phase since 2018 to now. It's like almost been interruptions because of the injuries, COVID, and then what's happened this year in terms of being on a team without proper resources. That's why Tom Brady's now a Buccaneer. And still having to go out there and show everybody you're still the same old Cam Newton. You just made a, a, a misstatement there, Greg. I would assume that because I know you do your research and you're a tremendous analyst. Because you said, what's special about Cam now? He doesn't run the football the same as Cam Newton used to run the football. And then Marcellus Wally over here, studious as I am, and having overprepared, looks at Cam Newton's average yard per attempt in terms of throwing the football, his highest mark since 2015. That's a positive. Let's look at Cam Newton, who has run for 387 yards this year, which ranks fourth among quarterbacks and is more than guys that we say have great running ability at the quarterback position. Does Josh Allen know how to run the football? Yeah, Cam Newton got mm. more yards than him. Russell Wilson, does he know mm. how to run the football? Yeah, Cam got more than him. Deshaun Watson with that bad offensive line running around, don't know what to do. Every play seems like a Hail Mary. Cam got more yards than him. I don't know what's special to you, Greg, but to me, Cam throwing the ball as best as he's ever done it, and Cam still running it better than guys that we are now acclaiming to be great dual threats. Sounds like a special player to me. Anyone want to retort? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't understand why Greg was taking all shots at Cam. Dude, I think Cam has been solid. Mm -hmm. He's been solid. He has nine touchdowns. This is the third most in his career. We're not even at the end of the season. He is a guy who still can run the ball. And if anything, I think Cam Newton will benefit from the fact that uh, yesterday we got a chance to see RG3 run around. RG3 looks nothing like the athlete that Cam Newton is. Mm -mm. If anything, that bodes well for Cam Newton as they talk about a guy aging well as a dual threat. And without a full offseason, without the ability Thank to really get you. on the field and learn Josh McDaniel's system, what can we really expect from Cam when everyone who's been in that system would tell you it's very complex. A lot of post-snap reads by the wide receivers and everything. And so in time, I think he has earned the respect of Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniels, and he will get another opportunity. Now, will the line be long for Cam Newton? No, because there's a tremendous class of quarterbacks coming in. But at some point, you need an older quarterback to kind of set the table for the young guys. I think Cam Newton has some value in that vein. Okay, let me let me let me first make this statement. <laughs> I'm not trying to attack Cam Newton. Mm -hmm, Y'all making it are. seem that's like I just are. came out that's here and do, just bro. tried to cut his legs from underneath him. And Marcellus, <laughs> please don't give me those rushing stats without telling me he leads all of those players that you said in rushing attempts. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> hey, that matters. Yeah, that doesn't help you, argument. You very. <laughs> You 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 easily decided to opt out that that little note right little there. Little omission. Anyway, <laughs> but since you guys have put me on this side of it, mm. of, of acting as though that I'm just the Cam Newton hater, which I am not, uh, give me a, a list of other quarterbacks that have more zero touchdown and two interception games. 
<laughs> oh, that would be Cam, that would be Cam Newton. I'm oh. sorry, guys. Look at, look at the list. He has three full screens, baby. Look, he has three. So he's been as 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 good as he's been with New England Patriots as far as being a great leader, throwing the ball better, averaging more yards at, at, at 7.5 yards, I think it is, upon completion. That's all great. And he's rushing the ball. He's being asked to do a ton. All I'm saying is when my eyes don't lie to me, I'm sorry, and I watch this film, he does not look like the same Cam Newton. And that is not going to change a year of age next year that, oh, he's going to be a better runner on less attempts, Marcellus. And he's going to be an even greater, better, a better, a more efficient and a better pocket pass. I don't, I just don't see all of those things really lining up for Cam Newton next year. Boy, I know when somebody's stuck, and I know when somebody's stuck on stupid. When they start saying, hey, the numbers, forget those. Hey, the evidence, forget that. My eyes don't lie to me. Oh, your <laughs> eyes, like, we go, the whole NFL world has to trust Greg Jennings' eyes versus the evidence that supports what we're saying. Greg, we love you up here, but we know you take shots at players. You know, Aaron Rodgers knows about you, Greg, and it feels like Cam Newton now knows about you as well, Greg. You like to just aim and just shoot. So here's the thing. If you want to shoot at Cam Newton, I'm going to tell you why the Patriots are going to be front of the line in terms of trying to get his services back next year. A team is as faithful as its options. And what are the options on the New England Patriots? Oh, Jared Stidham's there, right? Everybody said, put Jared Stidham in. They got polls going on now. Hey, should they platoon Stidham to see what they got in, in, in him in terms of being a draft choice? They're not going to do that. You know why they're not going to do that? Because they already know what they have in Stidham. Not much. The same guy who's been in five career games, 36 passer rating, one touchdown, and four interceptions. You can say, oh, that's a small sample size. Let's go back to his college career when his completion percentage went down each season in college and did his passing yards and attempt and his passer efficiency rating. Uh, so we didn't even see it in college from you, Jared Stidham. And now at the pro level, we're not seeing it. Oh, oh, I hear him now. Wait, the draft. We got to go out there and draft somebody. Forget Cam Newton. Uh, the Patriots are too good to be in a high lottery draft position, and they're going to be too bad that they're not even going to make it into the playoffs. They'll probably be right there as one of those bubble teams in the hunt. So there's no payday in the draft for the Patriots unless they want to spend that money or spend those resources and going to have to trade up to get one of these quarterbacks that have to transition to the NFL to become hopefully as good as Cam Newton. So it makes no sense. Cam Newton's been durable. He's been effective. He's been accurate. He's still running the football. And Belichick said in terms of his leadership, what we've gotten from the captains and some of the veterans last few weeks has been awesome. I think he's checking every single box, Greg, Bucky. I don't see why there wouldn't be a short line for Cam, especially with New England. Let me, let me, let me say this last thing, and I'm going to let you jump right in here, Bucky. You guys are saying it's going to – the question is, should teams be lining up? Yeah. I've heard one team from both of y'all, and it's the same team. That's <laughs> one. That's not a line. That is that is an that that gives the Patriots options. That means if nobody else is going to be pulling that cam, then we'll 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 explore all our options. That's all I'm saying. Mm. There is not going to be a line. Mm. There will not be. As much as we all want the best for Cam, I do too. I know it. Trust me, guys. I'm with you there. I want to see Cam on a team next year, and I want to see him play great. Will it probably be the New England Patriots? That is, it's looking like that's the only option. That's not a line. That's not that's not teams lining up. Uh, so I'm sorry, Bucky. Go ahead. Oh, now no, there's a line because I got, I got two because I told you I watched that game yesterday and after watching <laughs> RG3 pull a hamstring <laughs> run around the corner, I know Baltimore should call Cam. And then after no. looking at the wide receiver play quarterback for the Denver Broncos with Drew Lock and all those guys, there are two teams. There we go. Baltimore, Denver, then we throw in the Patriots. That is the short line that qualifies. Oh. There's a lineup right there for Cam Newton. 
Look, I'm over here scrambling right now trying to get my line together. Um, <laughs> I, I'm hoping the Denver Broncos give them a call. Uh, Cleveland, if they don't pick up the fifth-year option of Baker Mayfield, hey, a little transitional year, give Cam an opportunity. But I don't think he's going anywhere. Let's be real. The Washington football team in terms of Alex Smith or Dwayne Haskins or whatever the hell they're doing out there, let's be real. There are teams that are going to be in need of a quarterback, whether their sights are on the draft or their sights are on top free agents. All I know is Cam Newton has played well enough despite the circumstances really not supporting him to be one of the top free agents and hopefully having a line for him. Coming up, Carson Wentz is having the worst year of his career, but we'll tell you if he's actually broken. Next, speak for yourself. Broke down. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. The Eagles have underachieved big time this season, and a lot of fingers are pointed at Carson Wentz. Wentz leads the league in interceptions and is at the bottom of several other offensive categories. A local Philly blog made the case this week that Wentz is a broken quarterback and he should be benched for rookie Jalen Hurts. Ooh, shots. So, Greg, is Carson Wentz broken? Ooh, broken is harsh. That is harsh. That is like, uh, then he needs to be repaired. I think he's just suffered a, a, a few deep lacerations uh, that have carried over into the team. Going to town. And so he needs, to, yeah, he needs to be sidelined and allow for Jalen Hurst to insert and allow them to see some type of jolt and, and resurgence of their offense, of energy, something. There has to be a change. But what I don't want people to just automatically write off and assume is, at this quarterback position, sometimes we get caught up into this thought of there just has to be one. Well, when we look at the New Orleans Saints, like they have found a way to allow teams to prepare for dual quarterbacks. They don't know when Drew Brees, they don't know how many snaps Drew Brees is going to have. They don't know how many snaps Taysom Hill is going to have. But what it does create is an opportunity for two guys that have two unique skill sets to get on the field <laughs> at different times given the situation. And that's what I think the, the Philadelphia Eagles need to do. Move on to Jalen Hurst. That does not mean rid yourself of Carson Wentz and shelf him for the year. Use him when you know you need him, but allow Jalen Hurst to give you some type of boat of energy to go through this offense, allow this team to become galvanated and potentially make a playoff run. Yeah, man. Broken is harsh, but... Unfortunately, he's given us the ammunition to be harsh. So, yeah, I think he is broken. I didn't make up the term. Someone in Philadelphia did on the blog. <laughs> I'm just going to echo it. Yeah, he's broken. He has a fractured psyche, as we would say in my world. That's the diagnosis. The guy who looks at everything is half empty. His confidence is shot. Brian Gies Greasy said it after the Monday night football game. What's wrong with Carson Wentz? Right between the ears, right there upstairs. And in a world where it's mind over matter, if your mind is shot, everything else that you produce is going to be shot. Uh, I'm getting a little bored of talking about Carson Wentz in so many derogatory ways because it's unfair, because I'm rooting for the person. I'm rooting for the player. But me being the analyst, I have to call it like I see it. This is a guy that's been able to use so many different reasons slash excuses to why he's in this position right now. But Carson Wentz, you got paid. So one, you, you are not absolved of guilt because you got paid. Actually, that enhances the criticism that comes your way. Two, if you look at it in your Carson Wentz, why are you regressing in your fifth year? Like, I get it if you're out your prime, or I get it if you're so beat up that you know what, you just can't live up to your own standard. But you are with a quarterback whisperer in Doug Peterson, a guy who took a backup and won a Super Bowl with on your team, and now you're in your fifth year, and you're still regressing. It makes no sense. So I say insert Jalen Hurts for two reasons. One, we know because of the cap number, because of the dead cap number, that it's still going to be Carson Wentz's job. Somehow, some way, he's going to find himself in a starting lineup for the next year or two. Okay, so with that said, you put Jalen Hurts in there. Either A, Jalen Hurts goes out there and does worse than Carson Wentz. And I don't know how y'all play football, but sometimes it felt good to see somebody else do what I was 
was trying to do, but do it worse than me. Cause then I'm like, ah, I learned from that. <laughs> it's a real thing. I learned from that perspective. Like, oh, I ain't gonna do that. Oh, bing, the light goes off. And now you start to do it a different way. Just that deep moment to exhale. Or Jalen Hurst goes out there and balls out, actually plays better. You think Carson Wentz's ego is just going to say, oh, let him have a job. Oh, let him be the starting quarterback. Nah, that's going to motivate Carson Wentz. All he needs is a literal time out, a game or two. Let him just sit back and collect all the new information that he needs to assess how he's playing, and hopefully you'll get a better performance going forward. Yeah, he's, he's struggling right now. I mean, he, he's, he's deep in it. It is all between his ears. He's having a tough time finding his confidence, but – even though he's broken, I don't think you can completely remove him from the lineup. Too much money is tied into it. Too much is invested in him. He has to find a way to work through this. I think the pressure really goes to Doug Peterson because, Doug Peterson, you got to figure out how to do this because before they signed Carson Wentz to that big deal, I'm sure they went to Doug Peterson. They asked, hey, who do you want? You want Carson? You want Nick Foles? He opted for Carson. Hey, do you think we can win at a high level with Carson? I'm sure he said, absolutely. I believe this is my guy. Where if he is your guy, you got to fix him. And the way that they need to fix him, and looking at Carson play, they got to scale back. They got to simplify. They got to make it easy. If this was basketball, yeah. they got to get him some layups and some free throws. He has to see the ball go through the hoop. Now, I can't tell him exactly how to do it. I, I would say that Carson needs to lean into his athleticism. He is not a guy who is a traditional pocket passer that can deliver dime after dime from the pocket. It's on him. It's on Doug Peterson. They have to craft his plan to really help him find himself. And some of that needs to be by simplifying and reducing the load that he has on his plate. Well, you talk about it being on Doug Peterson. And I think you're exactly right. You got to you gotta establish some type of running game. When your quarterback is struggling, the way that Carson Wentz is struggling, what tends to happen is we all do it. Your team is losing. You're the guy. You're putting added pressure on yourself. And right now, Carson Wentz cannot handle all of that. We saw it with Russell Wilson. Mm. Should Russell Wilson cook? Yeah, let him cook. But as long as you're cooking, it, it, the, the more you cook, mm. the more pressure is surmounting upon your shoulders. And that's what we see with Carson Wentz. And we saw Russell Wilson start throwing a couple picks. What did they do? They had to scale back. Whoa, let me pull back the range. It doesn't mean... You can't still be the, the great player that we know that you are, but let us take some of that load off of your plate. And that's what you're talking to, uh, the point you're talking about, Bucky, when you talk about uh, Doug Peterson taking some of that pressure and ownership on him, putting it on him as a play caller, help your personnel. You have the, uh, all the opportunity to help and assist every player that you put out there on that field which is why I say you insert Jalen Hurst in a way kind of like Sean Payton has done with Taysom Hill. Everyone was against it, but you ask any opposing defense that has to prepare for the New Orleans Saints, it's a struggle. Why? Because I'm preparing not only for Drew Brees, but Taysom Hill and his running ability, his athleticism. It's a different dynamic. That's what you need. That changes things up offensively. It changes things up for defensive defensive coordinators when it comes to preparation, and it could potentially equate to possibly a change up on the scoreboard. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of he has to stay out there because of the money. I understand business 101, and that's how the game goes. But in a situation where you're sacrificing 51, 52 other guys just for one because you paid him foolishly, doesn't make a ton of sense to me. I don't want the entire squad to suffer just because of the issues of one. Think about it. How many times you been to somebody's house and you saw something ugly on the wall, that ugly ass painting, ugly rug, and they, just, they justify it. Oh, do you know how much it costs? Don't care, dog. It's ugly. It's just simple as that. Like, <laughs> don't care how much you pay for it. it. Like, he's not that good. And I keep hearing the same issues or reasons or excuses, how y'all want to call it. It's his offensive line. He doesn't have a good offensive line. Look, I get it. What they've had, 11 different rotations, a carousel. But let's look deeper than just the rotations. Carson Wentz has had the 6-6 six, six most clean dropbacks in the NFL this year with 275. Told you I'm a nerd. Here's the thing. Where does that rank Carson Wentz in terms of how effective he is in those clean pockets? His passer rating is 83 in clean pocket plays. That's 36 
out of 39. Wait a minute, Carson Wentz. So when even they give you a clean pocket, we already know your accuracy yeah, is not going to get the ball to the proper receiver. Oh, we don't have receivers. Oh, really? Travis Fulgham is the 42nd ranked wide receiver, according to Pro Football Focus. That's an uh, elite grade, higher than C.D. Lamb and Jerry Judy and all these other youngsters that are out there doing well. Oh, you want to talk about the rest of the receiving core? You, they're not doing so well. Richard Rodgers is balling. You got an elite grade there. Uh, Goddard is balling. Zach Ertz, when healthy, is balling. So then you start to say, well, it's the running game. We don't have a running game. Miles Sanders, uh, you don't give him enough touches. But let's talk about those touches when he gets them. 5.6 yards per attempt, second in the NFL. What are we talking about here? Everything with a common denominator of an issue really points back to Carson Wentz. I hate to be this guy, but as I went up the mountain and I went down the mountain, I learned a lot. And one thing that you should know for sure is that most of your problems are with that man in the mirror. Okay, it's Marcel. It's like, I, I, I like the points that you brought up, but I, I believe they point to someone else, not Carson Wentz. Oh. Even though he is playing like Boo Boo, it, it sounds like the coach needs to figure out how to prioritize their game plan mm. and their play calling. You somebody. talked about the running game being good. You talked about Travis <laughs> Morgan being effective. You talked about the two tight ends. Um, Dallas Goddard being effective. Zach Ertz, when he's healthy, he's effective. It sounds like it should be on Doug Peterson to figure out, hey, less of Carson Wentz, more of the other guys. That will help the quarterback get on track. And then when I look at this team, I just believe right now Doug Peterson is calling plays. He's not running a system. He's just dialing up plays like we're playing a video game, but he doesn't have a system in place. If they can find a way to have a systematic approach for attacking, I think it will lessen the burden on Carson Wentz to have to play like an elite player for this team to win games. I like that. I like that pushback because I don't have the answers. And it certainly can be Carson Wentz is just doo-doo, just boo-boo trash. Like, there's something I mean, he left. Is bad. He, he's, he's bad. bad but... We've all been there before where you're at the bottom, like the toothpaste at the bottom, and you got to wring it out. You got to squeeze it differently. You got to even use some water to get in there. Like, there's some toothpaste left in this tube. But I leave you with these nuggets right here, and you tell me how much toothpaste and how, for how long. Let's look at quarterbacks since 1970, like when Bucky was playing. Quarterbacks that have <laughs> attempted over 400 <laughs> passes. Their touchdown percentage is less than 3%. Their interception percentage is greater than 2%, and their completion percentage is less than 60%. All things that Carson Wentz has done. We've only seen that bad performance level from 53 different quarterbacks. And then the next year, you know how many were allowed to be even on that roster? Six to do it again. You know how many times this happened? Three times? Zero in NFL history. So we can say what we want about Carson Wentz right now, but history shows it won't be for long if he keeps up this poor performances. Coming up, LeBron and AD are running it back for a few more years. Damn it. Are they seriously? All right, <laughs> we'll tell you if the Kings' path to a fifth title just got a little easier. Next, speak for yourself. Lakers aren't resting after winning the title. LeBron James agreed to a two-year, $85 million extension that will keep him in Los Angeles for the next three seasons. Then earlier today, news broke that Anthony Davis is finalizing a five-year, $190 million max contract to stay with the Lakers. L.A. already made big moves earlier this offseason, including Ad Montrez, Hare, Boo, and Dennis Schroeder to the roster. Fox NBA analyst Chris Broussard and Slick Rick the Buker are back and joining me. So, Slick Rick. You're up first. Will LeBron have an easy path to a fifth title this year? Marcellus, Chris, there are no easy paths oh, to championships. So let's not undersell the challenge of winning any championship. And certainly let's not undersell the fact that we are in unknown territory right now when it comes to still being in the midst of a pandemic. The reality is, didn't we, weren't we talking about the Clippers in the same fashion at the beginning of last season? Mm. They looked like they had the Bentley at the starting line. And how did that end up? Well, part of it is because they ended up having to go over rough terrain that we couldn't have anticipated where we get a full stop in the season and then we get a bubble. Same things are in play here when it comes to, uh, certainly we've already had, what, 48, nearly 50 players that have tested positive. Uh, there are going to be outbreaks. 
the, the, the schedule is so uncertain that the league is not even releasing the second half because that they know they're going to have to reschedule things. And let's add in the fact that they they have made a number of changes. Okay, well, what was one of the greatest things that the Lakers had was their chemistry last year. Anthony Davis, we've never seen him play as many games as uh, anticipated that he would have to play this year to win another championship. And LeBron James, I know he seems to be the energizer bunny, but at some point, age has to show up, does it not? So... Does he have the best team he's ever had at the starting line? Without question. But to suggest that the path is going to be easy would suggest that we know what the path is going to look like, and we simply don't. Uh, we know what the path's going to look like. Another abbreviated season. We do know that. That's not unfamiliar territory. And the Lakers are the kings of this uh 2.0 asterisk season because we saw how they looked in 1.0 asterisk season. I see you, Chris Broussard. Yeah, I said it. Damn it. It was an abbreviated <laughs> season that lend itself easily to the Lakers and their fortunes because you have an aging star and LeBron James. No signs of slowing down, but certainly benefits when you keep giving them abbreviated seasons. That said, I'm looking at this team, and I was a little jealous this offseason. I ain't gonna lie. Watching all the transactions and, you know, AD signing, LeBron signing, duh. We knew that was gonna happen. But picking up my Trez Harrell, taking him from the Clippers, that hurt a little bit until I reminded myself how bad how horrible Montrez Harrell was in the playoffs for my same Clippers. So, yeah, take that problem and put him on your squad, and let's see how that works out in your postseason fortunes. Oh, you want to bring in Schroeder as well. Oh, you want to take out Rondo, bring in Schroeder. I love Rondo's playoff experience, playoff Rondo. And now you got a guy who's only played three career postseason victory games. Hmm, a little difference in experience. So I'm looking at the Lakers as – a team that won a championship by the slimmest of margins. Let's think about what that is. It's not about wins and losses in the series. It's about how you were playing in those same games and that how that added up to a championship. 18 champions since the NBA went to a 4-7 game series since 2002. Let's talk about what the Lakers were. Of all those champions, the one that allowed the most points per game, the one that allowed the highest opponent's field goal percentage, and the one that allowed the highest opponent's three-point percentage. What does that mean to me? That I'm looking at the field, the other 29 teams, as they have to be salivating because the Lakers got by in an abbreviated season, an asterisk season. But this year, people are going to see that coming, and teams are going to test those weaknesses and vulnerabilities of those same champions. All right, Marcellus, that was spoken like a true Clippers homer. I, don't, I ain't even I mean, them. enough with the asterisks. <laughs> I knew enough that was Enough with coming. the asterisks abbreviated season talk. First of all, remember, LeBron at his age, he's about to be 36, is getting hardly any type of offseason. He's losing 30 days from what your typical championship team loot, loot has before the season began. So that doesn't help him. Secondly, 72 games, okay, it's not 82, but it hardly qualifies as some major abbreviated season. Okay, it's not quite oh, the full season, oh, okay. but 72 games is still a lot. So I got to shoot that down immediately. Rick was far more on point, although the <laughs> only thing I question with Rick is he said this is definitely LeBron's well, I'm not best done team yet. to start well, the season. More to be questioned. Okay. Because maybe, because you know, one of those Miami teams might argue with that. But let me let me go to the other teams. I do think the Lakers are the heavy favorite. They should be the favorites. But it's not going to be easy. Because everybody is sleeping on your Clippers, Marcellus, mm -hmm. at their own peril. I'm not saying they're definitely going to beat the Lakers because the Lakers are the favorites. However, the Clippers will be better. They will be humbled. They will be motivated. Their chemistry will be better. Serge Ibaka was a great pickup because he's close with Kawhi. He can bring out the fun guy, and I think that'll make everyone else like Kawhi a lot more. He'll be more involved with the entire team, and Serge is just a great locker room guy in general. Luke Kennard, if he's healthy, is a nice pickup. Obviously, Marcus Morris is still there. I know I hear the talk, oh, they needed a point guard, and I get that, but they got two great wing players 
both of whom can handle the basketball, can make plays for themselves and others. And, and Ty Lue will, I think, do great things for their chemistry. He'll insert more strategic things like pace and space, more ball movement. So the Clippers are going to be better than they were last year, as I expect the Lakers to be. But I'll give the Clippers a shot, even though the Lakers are the favorites. Uh, you know, Chris, I'm very interested by that whole description of the Clippers because you left out one very important name to be able to identify exactly what he's going to do. And that would be one Mr. P.G. Paul George. You mm. didn't say a word mm. about how he fits in to this dynamic, and that is a big question for them. I do believe, to your point, the Clippers will be better because they're not going to be favored. And they now have a vendetta because they have really been knocked down a couple of pegs. But they are still missing that leadership. And Kawhi, the fun guy, may come out. But what we learned from last year and everything that we've heard about the Clippers last year was that the leadership of Fred Van Vliet and Kyle Lowry in Toronto was an important part and of, of winning a championship there. Kawhi might have been the best player, but he wasn't the leader in Toronto and he wasn't the leader in San Antonio. They're still missing that element with the Clippers. Now, the other thing you said about the Lakers being the prohibitive favorite, that's the most interesting part here for me because if I look at LeBron James' teams, he's never, other than maybe the first year in Miami, and we know how that turned out, He's never been the prohibitive favorite from the beginning of the season. And as both of you gentlemen know, that comes with a certain weight and expectation and a microscope with everything that you do. We saw how the Clippers did not handle that very well. Now, LeBron has checked every single box. He has experienced just about everything. But again... It's new territory to be this heavily favored from the very beginning for LeBron James. And we know he kind of likes that underdog role. How's he going to handle it? Again, new territory here to suggest that the path is going to be easy, particularly on those circumstances, I think is not taking into account everything that the Lakers face. Interesting, because I'm looking at it simply as this. Not even being a Clipper homer, you know I am. I don't have to show my colors. I wear them. But at the same time, I'm looking at it like it's a 29-team field versus the Lakers. And I'm rolling the dice saying one of those 29 teams are going to be in contention and really give the Lakers a scare. Why do I say that? I, one, I'm not going to sit up here and allow Chris Broussard to minimize, to understate the importance of taking 10 games off of a regular season schedule and how that's a positive effect for the Lakers and especially LeBron at this age. It's like 12, 13% of the games wiped off the calendar. And Chris, if I walk up to you right now and say, hey, I got a million dollar check for you, you light up. If I came to you right after, it's like, sorry, sorry, big dog. I actually have an $877,000 check. You're still going to light up, but it ain't the same wattage. You know why? Because you already <laughs> know <laughs> the difference. And that's the same thing from 72 games to 82 games. There's a different amount of wattage. LeBron James right now is asking his body, he's asking Father Time, please hold off because only four players have won back-to-back -back titles at an older age than LeBron will be next year during championship time. And that's Kareem, David West, Ron Harper, and Dennis Rodman. Oh, let me remind you that even Kareem in that stage of his career was not the one carrying the torch for the team. He was not the leader of that team. And right now, it's going to have to be a transfer of power strictly to AD because if LeBron tries to go out there and carry it himself – Ah, history shows that the older you get, the less likely it is for you to be the guy that's going to lead them to a championship. So, Chris, you want to talk about the money? You want to talk about the schedule? You want to talk about the field? Whatever you want to do, Chris, I need to hear something because right now it sounds like you being the Laker homer. Well, now, look, I, again, they're the heavy favorites, as Rick said, but I agree with you that it's going to be tough. I'm giving your Clippers a shot. I don't think Denver could beat the Lakers. But, you know, they might be able to push them a little bit. Here's the team I want to look at, though. Brooklyn. People are sleeping on Brooklyn. And look, it's uh. a heck of a chemistry experiment. 
It, but Help hold, me. I, I, I give you. I know what you're Help going me. at. Help me. I'm sleeping it on. It is I'm a heck on of Brooklyn. a chemistry I am, I am experiment. Snoozing on book. <laughs> <laughs> but here, here's all I'm saying. Here's all I'm saying. Hmm. Because it could blow up. I mean, we know Kyrie and and KD, and you talk about leadership. They got a leadership issue too, just like the Clippers. However, if they emerge from the East, might be a big if, not a big if, but a slight if. If they get past Philly, which I think will be improved, past Milwaukee, which we know is trying to win it in Giannis's last year, a Miami, a Boston, who are both hungry, if they get out of the East, that means they're playing well. That means Kyrie and KD are on the same page. It means players have all bought in. It means Steve Nash and Mike D'Antoni have gotten through to these guys and are doing a good coaching job. And on paper... They would be able to compete with the Lakers. So if Brooklyn can put it all together and get out of the East, then I think they give the Lakers a shot in the finals, too. Well, I'm just proud of myself for not bringing up the Clippers first in priority. I'm proud of you, too, Chris, for bringing up the Clippers. But right now on paper, the Lakers look like the winning team at the park. That also is getting winner's takeout. That means every shot they make, they get to take the ball out. And when they lose a player, they get to pick the replacement player first instead of the losing team. They have really stacked the deck for them this year. But I still won't hop on that train. It's still Clip City, Chip City. Coming up in our big story, the Cowboys only have three wins this year. But we'll tell you if they can still win the NFC East. Next, speak for yourself. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. Back to the NFL and the Cowboys, who are in last place in NFC lease right now. But there could be some hope. Dallas has five more games this season, and only one of them is against a team that currently has a winning record. They face the Ravens Tuesday on Fox. So, Bucky, can the Cowboys still win this sorry division, NFC East? Absolutely. It's right there for them. It it's right there for them. The toughest game that they have coming up, the Baltimore Ravens, and then the other game would be the San Francisco 49ers. The rest of the games are divisional games. It's just about the Cowboys finding the right way to play. I don't know what has happened to Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy has become the gambling. He's doing all these things that are uncharacteristic of the guy that I saw in Green Bay. But hopefully he's got that out of his system. He gets back to playing in a conservative style that really leans on Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard running the ball, Andy Dalton being conservative, and then the defense getting timely stops. If they do that, the Cowboys can absolutely win this division because I think they still have more talent than the rest of the teams in this division. Yeah, it's interesting, man. You talk about the right way to play. It's just let Zeke lead the way. Of course, the Cowboys can still win this division. It's right there for them, as you said, Bucky. It's funny, if you look at it, you start to say now – Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard. Wow, Zeke, you better watch your back, big dog, because that's how they get you when it starts to be in rotation on the field or in conversation off the field. When they start coupling your name, you're looking at them like, hey, bro, we the same? And actually, in this situation, no, you're not. Tony Pollard looks better than you, Ezekiel Elliott, if I were to take the names off the back of the jersey right now. That said, let's focus in on this running game and how they need to give Zeke the ball. He needs his touches. All of their wins have come when Zeke has carried the ball 19-plus times. And we know they had some close losses even when they tried to feed Zeke. The loss to the Rams and that Ben DiNucci game against the Eagles, which they didn't really have a capable quarterback out there, Denver Broncos style. But bottom line, the Cowboys are and have always been a team that when they feed Zeke, they're a highly functioning offense, and that's what they need to do. You look at the schedule, you just broke it down. The schedule suggests that the Cowboys have the easiest path. You're talking about them having the third easiest schedule. Rest of the division, all of the other teams, 12th toughest remaining or more difficult than that. So if you look at it strictly by the terrain in front of you and also the assets you have on your team, feed Zeke, feed Tony, and let's see what they can do with that running game leading the way. Yeah, it sounds good. I just don't oh, believe that they can execute it, oh. which is why I'm saying no. 
Uh, mm. I don't believe they can because a lot of their issues are within. It's not so much looking at who they have on the schedule. Look at who mm. they have beaten mm. on their own schedule. That's the Atlanta Falcons who are four and seven. It's the Giants who are four and seven. And then it's the Minnesota Vikings who are five and six. Have they beaten a team that has any type of growth or potential to be a 500 team? No, but one thing I will say is, yes, their schedule is favorable. But the teams that they are playing on that schedule, which they got to get the Giants again, they're a much better team than they faced the first time. And I believe they are better coached and more disciplined team than they play, faced the first time. So when you look at these scenarios, yes, does it lay up for them? Of course you can say that. I just don't believe that they will <laughs> execute it because of how their season has gone. It's an internal thing. You got guys kind of giving chatter within the locker room, kind of talking about one another, saying that they don't like what coaches is doing here and there. And when you start having issues like that, it's hard to write that shit. I, I can't believe, Greg, you're falling for Seriously. the okie doke because Joe Judge and those guys are doing up downs. <laughs> up downs and running laps. And you're saying that they're better coached right. than the Cowboys? Yeah. I, I, I'm shocked. Daniel Jones, their starting quarterback, is hurt. They already knocked off the Giants before, so they'll knock them off again. The Philadelphia Eagles, we just talked about, can't get right for an entire segment. Mm. So that's two wins right there. Boom. Now it's about trying to find a way to win. Maybe one out of the three is Baltimore, San Francisco, and Cincinnati. We'll chalk up Cincinnati. So now it's, can they beat San Francisco or Baltimore? Surely they can find a way to get one dub out of those. Right there, that, push, that puts them right in. They're in. The Cowboys are in. Yeah, it's funny. Let me, let me tell you something. Oh, I, go ahead. I, I, just, I just watched the 49ers play. They're not beating the Niners. Oh, They're not going to oh, beat good. the Niners. And since, we, since, we're, since, we're in the, since we're in the business of just giving wins and losses, I'll go to this one. They're not beating the Niners, and they're not going to beat the Giants, and they're not going to beat the Eagles. And they're definitely not going to beat the Baltimore Ravens. So that <laughs> leaves them out. I'll give you one of the last <laughs> remaining five. What? Are you kidding me? All right, all right. This is how it's going to go down. If you beat the Baltimore Ravens, everybody like, how are you going to beat the Baltimore Ravens? Well, you can run the ball on the Baltimore Ravens. 11th worst, yeah. 11th worst rushing yardage allowed per game, 4.5. So we're going to pound the ball against the Baltimore Ravens and hope that we can have a victory there. Listen to what happens then. You know us players, we used to do this all the time on sitting there with the schedule. All right, yeah, the Giants, we did. Yep, the Giants <laughs> going to lose to the Seahawks. Okay, okay, I'm with you, big dog. And the Eagles, <laughs> they're going to lose to Green Bay. Aye, right, aye. Right. And Washington going to lose to San Fran. Oh, you got me, big dog. Guess what that means? With four games to go, the Dallas Cowboys will be sitting there tied for the division lead. Just that simple. Yeah. And that's just one week, Greg. I don't know what the hell you talking about. They're not going to win here and win that. <laughs> Everything I said sounded feasible, sounded like it's going to happen. So I don't see how you say this team can't win. So, so, like I said, since our stats are coming off of just our word of mouth and what we think and hope to win to happen and play out because our point will be made there, look at the way this team has played all year. They just haven't played where you talk about them beating the Baltimore Ravens, Marcellus. And is it possible? Yes, but they have to execute a game plan. Chill. And they have not been able to do that all year. You talk about a way that they can actually beat the Baltimore Ravens, which is running the football. If they run the football, we know that they are pass heavy. They just rely on the throwing of the football. They don't turn around and hand the ball off to their two-headed monster now that they have. So I don't see them actually being able to effectively execute. And let me say this. They do have to play defense. They do. They do. The defense has Man. to tighten up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Turkey Day was not a great day for them. Antonio Gibson had a big day. They, they kind of got away from it. But I'm going to say a lot of this comes down to Mike McCarthy. I think some of the issues that you saw in the run game that happened in the fourth quarter, they were deflated. The fake punt at your own 20 Everyone on the sideline, we've been there. Everyone is like, what in the world are we doing as they run onto the field? And so they lost their way. But I think with the extended time, because the Ravens situation has pushed the game back to next Tuesday, I think they'll be refocused. The bye week will kind of give them an opportunity to clean up some of the issues. And remember, not many of us thought they could be the Minnesota Vikings and that running attack. Mm. So as I look at not only Baltimore, but I look at San Francisco, there is a blueprint for them to execute where they're able to slow it down. 
We'll see if they can get it done. But I know those last two, put them in the win column. The Giants. <laughs> Chalk them up. And the Bengals. Don't act like they can't beat the Bengals. That's another one. That's three wins right there. We ain't even got to the rest of the schedule right now. It takes seven to get them in. Yeah. Seven to get them in. Thank so we you. got three right now. We just got to figure out where that other win is coming from. But there are three already on the table. If this is space, so, I feel good about the books. I feel good about the books that I got so, on the table. So they got, they got three wins out of their first 11 games. Now all of a sudden they going four out of five for the letting. Hey, the, the schedule was the different season. then. The schedule was different in the early part of the season. It's about how you stack them up. And now they're going to stack them up. But the players ain't. Well, 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 hey. Players aren't. Well, wait a minute. You went out there and said the defense hasn't tightened up over the season. Yes, they have. The first four games, they allowed three teams to go over 400 plus yards, but only twice in the wait, last wait, wait, seven wait, games. Wait, 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 like, wait. I like how you I like how you put that phrase in my mouth saying the defense hasn't tightened up. Well, I said just, they have to play defense. Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, they have been playing defense if you looked at the last seven games. I don't go know. Ahead, go if ahead. If you stuck finish, on the finish, first four finish games. Making, finish making your point. Finish I don't have a point. Your point. I don't really it. have a point. All I'm saying is feed <laughs> Zeke. You're 23 and four all time when Zeke gets over 100 yards. It's just that simple. Feed Zeke and don't fumble. All right, it's time to make our picks for this week's free-to-play Super 6 contest. Rams are on the road against the Cardinals in one of the matchups this week. Greg, since you're calling the game and you're so negative, we'll leave you out. So, Bucky, give me a winner and by how many? Ooh, give me the Cardinals. I think the Cardinals are smarter from that last loss. Give me the Cardinals by seven. They win a divisional game against the Rams. Okay, I got the Rams winning by two. It's going to be a close game because it's in the division, but Rams, you sneak by with the victory. Download the Fox Super 6 app and make your picks before kickoff Sunday for your chance to win Terry Bradshaw's $100,000. All you have to do is correctly predict the outcome of six NFL games. And for top stories, scores, and more, go to the Fox Sports app. Coming up, the Steelers are still undefeated. Y'all like that pause? But Mike Tomlin isn't happy. We'll tell you if it's time for him to worry about his squad next. Speak for Yourself. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. The Steelers stayed undefeated after beating the Ravens yesterday, but it wasn't pretty. Pittsburgh dropped several passes and only converted one out of four attempts in the red zone, all while playing a depleted Ravens roster. After the game, Mike Tomlin was clearly not happy with his team's performance. Take a listen. It was really junior varsity, to be quite honest with you, uh, and it was in all three phases. We couldn't run the ball effectively when we needed to. We dropped too many significant passes, very catchable, makeable passes. We're, we're fortunate tonight. Um, it's good to, to proceed um, with the victory. I acknowledge that. Uh, but not a lot happened tonight to be proud of or to be excited about other than that. All right. So, Greg, should Mike Tomlin be worried about the Steelers like he sounds? <laughs> Uh, if they play the way they did last yesterday, yes, he should. But this is Mike Tomlin understanding what's in front of him mm. and knowing what they have the opportunity to accomplish this year. They're an 11-0 and football team who beat a, a Baltimore Ravens team that was without their starting quarterback and a lot of other guys, and, and they barely got by. And it wasn't the Pittsburgh Steelers that we've seen all year. Defensively, they gave up big plays. Like he said, offensively, they were inconsistent. As a coach, the number one thing you have to battle against when your team has gone undefeated is complacency. That's what Mike Tomlin is trying to prevent his team from doing is settling and thinking that every win is a gimme just because they're undefeated. That is not the case. Anytime you have a, a no, a, no blemishes in the L column, teams are going to give you their best shot. And so he wants his team to remain sharp. He's not doing what Bruce Arian is doing down in Tampa Bay, calling out individual players. Mm. He's calling out his entire team so that they can rec rectify what they are watching right now on film so that it doesn't protrude over into their next game against this, the, the Washington football team. Yeah, I love what Tomlin said in terms of really highlighting the difference between performance and outcome. As former players, we all know the difference. There are times when you go out there and you win a game and you walk in that locker room, you make sure no one's looking at you. You're like, damn, 
We shouldn't have won that game. I don't know how that happened. And there are games where you lose and you're like, yo, I went out there and destroyed them dudes. How did we lose that game? So it's important that your coach talks matter of fact to your team and to his audience and saying there's a difference between performance and outcome. Of course, I'm going to applaud the outcome. We won the game. We're still undefeated. But look at our performance. Sooner or later, that's going to catch up to us as a team if we don't fix these issues. But their issues are not that bad. Their issues are not drastic. Obviously, the old formula was run the football, stop the run, and play defense. That's championship football. I think the formula's been remixed of late because of the league and it being a passing league. Basically, have yourself a quarterback. Make sure you can get to the other team's quarterback and play some defense your damn self. And that's what the Pittsburgh Steelers can do and do very well. They have Ben Roethlisberger where some people are saying this is the best they've seen in Ben Roethlisberger, <clears throat> in part because he's getting the ball out faster, and that's the formula. Lean on your defense and get the ball out your hands fast and get it to your playmakers. But also the fact that they can get to the opposing team's quarterback because of how great they are in leading the league in sacks this year. So you talk about them being first in takeaways as well. This is a team that basically has all the winning attributes you need, which is have you a damn good quarterback, an MVP candidate, some say. Also have a front line on defense that can get to that quarterback and then an entire defense that can play and play well in terms of the points per game allowed. I like, I like Pittsburgh a lot. Mike Tomlin didn't like what he saw yesterday, but in totality, I know he's loving what he's seeing. Well, I mean, I, I, I like the Steelers, but I think they have an Achilles heel. Their Achilles heel comes in two fashions. One, they're able to run the football, and mm. because they're unable to run the football, goal line and short yardage situations, they're not able to impose their will. That comes up and becomes a major factor. When they play a team like the Kansas City Chiefs, where you don't want to have a fast break contest against Pat Mahomes and company. You want to slow the ball down. You want to slow the game down and control it. Well, they have to be able to run it, and they're unable to do so. And so I don't mind the ball being in Ben Roethlisberger's hands. I don't necessarily love the fact that he threw the ball 51 times, but it's a lot of dink and dunk paper cuts. And I just wonder, when they begin to get into the postseason and it gets tight and it gets snug and people put their hands on their wide receivers, can those guys consistently uncover? We saw them against a physical Baltimore Ravens team. They had the dropsies. What is it going to be like when the pressure escalates and they need those guys to come up with those catches? You talk about them not being able to score or run the ball in the red zone. They were one of four against the Baltimore Ravens team. When you start to get into the playoffs, teams are going to prey on what you don't do well. So they're going to force you to become one-dimensional. And you talk about them throwing 51 times and it's dinking and dunking. That's when you look down the road and you see a Kansas City Chiefs team, everyone looks and wants to be that. They can't. Why? Because they have explosive plays waiting in the wings all across the field. We don't see that with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And when you, yes, can they play great defense? They can. But it all it takes is one big play. And they, the other team can possibly get it. This Pittsburgh Steelers team, they don't produce them as frequently as they would like to and that they need to. So you talk about needing to be able to run the ball in the postseason. If you're going to host games, and right now it's looking like they will be able to host at least one playoff game if they keep winning, you got to run the ball when that weather is not right. And trust me, being a receiver in the cold climate, I don't care who you are. You don't want that ball coming that hard <laughs> in that weather when it's minus 10 and that you trying to stay warm, but you got to pluck the ball. Yeah, it looks good on television, <laughs> but in reality, we need to run the ball to get up out of here. Well, it's interesting. There's two ways to run the football now in today's NFL. You can run the ball traditionally, or you can have what, what Bucky was talking about, the paper cuts out there, dink and dunk offense. You can have the long handoff, which is the short passing game. And that's what Pittsburgh has. you got to talk about how efficient they are in their passing game. Ben Roethlisberger throws the ball the fastest of all quarterbacks in the NFL this year at 2.29 seconds on average. Why does that matter? Because... The best line, the best protection any quarterback has is him being decisive with the football. Forget the offensive lineman in front of him. If he's getting rid of that ball to the tune of what Roethlisberger is doing this year, 
How are you going to get to them? So I look at this as a team that can strike. You guys are saying, well, they don't do it in a traditional sense. You don't think of them like you think of the Green Bay Packers and their big play offense. You don't think of them like you think of the Chiefs and their big play offense. Or even the Seahawks and Russell Wilson throwing the best deep ball in our game. But behind those teams, Packers, Chiefs, and Seahawks are the Steelers at fourth in scoring offense, right there hovering around 30. So they find a way to get down to the end zone methodically, slow, deaf by a thousand paper cuts. But it happens. I think this team is built for postseason football because they have the defense and they have the quarterback and the pass rush to get after it. Coming up, Tom Brady is calling the plays, but his Bucks are struggling. We'll tell you if Tampa should be giving Brady so much power. Next, speak for yourself. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. The Bucks are sitting at 7-5, and five, and Tom Brady has not looked like the GOAT in Tampa. Bruce Arians said after their loss to the Chiefs Sunday that Brady, quote, picks all the plays now. We call what he picks. WEEI reports that Brady is working off the Bucks' playbook, but he gets to pick what he wants to run. Hmm. So, Bucky, is it smart of the Bucks to let Tom Brady run the offense? Run! Run! run. Oh, I mean... I mean, this is what everyone wanted. They wanted the quarterback to have full control so he could be comfortable. Tom Brady has gotten the ultimate hall pass from everybody, coaches, players, media members. We never criticize him when he underperforms. It's always everybody else around him. The players aren't good enough. The coaches aren't doing their job. But we never look at TB12. I think at some point we have to examine how he is playing and how he has traditionally played down the stretch. He typically has faded. And so Bruce Arians has given him everything that he needed. And so now we need to see, can Tom Brady make it happen? Yes, it's smart for them to let him pick his plays, but now we need to see Tom Brady play well. He is turning the ball over too much. They're sitting at 7-5. and five. I don't know how good they are. I just know that their quarterback is certainly not playing at a high enough <laughs> level to get them over the top. You know, it's interesting that we're in a world that always suggests to you that you have to pick a side instead of looking at the merger, the integration of these philosophies. And that could be the, the best for them in terms of playing optimal football. So, yeah, it's cool that the Bucks let Tom Brady run the offense. But as long as the offense is still having key components from Bruce Arians and his philosophy, then that's the perfect world. We're talking about interdependence right here instead of independence, Tom Brady's way or Bruce Arians' way. And I think you come to higher ground once you realize that they are integrating each other's philosophies into this offense. There's some examples out there, key example being what we saw last week from this team. When you're talking about the, what they say, the middle four, the last two minutes before half and the first two minutes after the half, Bill Belichick was known for always making sure he tried to command and own that real estate, those four minutes. Why? He liked to score right before half, get the ball back and score again. And before you blink, you're like, damn, we were up in this game. Now we find ourselves behind. That's what Bill Belichick taught Tom Brady. What's happening with Bruce Arians is more of a traditional philosophy. Every time you got the ball, score. Every time you have the ball, let's risk it. Let's go out there and light up the scoreboard, which at times will compromise your defense if you strike fast or if you throw a lot of incompletes. What happened last time they went out there? They saved enough time for an opponent to go out there and march down the field and kick a field goal. So what they're having right now is a difference in those philosophies. I don't think it's about the actual plays. It's how we're going to orchestrate these plays into a ball game. Tom Brady wants to be conservative, always thinking complimentary. Okay, let's wear down the clock. Let's run the ball, short dink and dunks, so that we have the ball last. But we see with Bruce Aarons, he doesn't necessarily manage the clock or manage his team in that same mentality. It's going to be an integration of those two mindsets that makes them play greater than the sum of his parts. Yeah, I don't think it's smart to allow Tom Brady to just run with the offense and call the plays and run whatever play that he seems fitting. I think in situations, all quarterbacks should be allowed to do that, like two-minute no huddle, hurry up offenses. If you have the talent at quarterback and they have the smarts to do it, then yes, give them that freedom. But to put all the weight 
of play calling and calling the right play, getting your offense in the right play protection and what have you. That is a lot to put on a quarterback who is in the first year system uh, with this offense and this head coach. Look at the Green Bay Packers. And I know I talk about them a lot, but last year, Aaron Rodgers and, and Matt LaFleur were able to get it done. Aaron Rodgers felt like, man, I want more of what I do best in this offense. It wasn't that he wanted to call the plays. It was he wanted what he can perform at a high level and what he was comfortable doing. This year, they've done that, and they've been even better, not even record-wise as of yet, but they've been better effectively moving forward as an offense. In Tom Brady and Bruce Arian's situation, that is what would work best. If he gets his piece of offense, like you're talking about, Marcellus, is, is implementing both parties together collectively and moving forward. Tom Brady is too smart of a quarterback. He's accomplished too much to not have his input and to not listen to what works well and what he's most comfortable with and implementing that into your offense. As Bruce Arians has, what from what we've heard, of what we've heard, he has not done that. So I don't think you give him the entire playbook and say, here, you run it. Yes, you pick the plays. Every quarterback picks the plays on Tuesday off day, they go in with the coordinator and they say, okay, do, the, do we like these plays? Yes. You run the plays all week. You see what plays have worked, what plays have not. And at the end of the week, you decide what plays are staying in the play call and what plays are out. And that's what quarterbacks tend to do on all 32 teams. So that's not out of the norm, but all the plays, nah. Yeah, I'm That's glad that you highlighted that they're only four months into this situation, so people need to calm down. Like, they're still learning this on the fly because of the compromise offseason. Rome wasn't built in a day, but it was destroyed in like a second. It happens fast when it goes down. But in terms of constructing it, it takes time. So after having played the seventh toughest schedule – and that's all the way up to week 12 without a bye. Now they have the third easiest remaining schedule. So there will be greener pastures in front of them, not only because of the opponents that they're playing, but because of the integration of philosophies. Coming up, be careful if you try to compliment DK Metcalf. That's word on the streets. We'll tell you which side we're on in the Metcalf Jim Swartz feud. Next, speak for yourself and made us Swartz. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. DK Metcalf went off Monday night in the Seahawks win against the Eagles, and we might know why now. Metcalf said he had a chip on his shoulder because during pregame, Philly's defensive coordinator, Jim Schwartz, compared him to his former receiver, Calvin Johnson, but added, quote, you're not there yet. Metcalf even posted an image from Michael Jordan in the last dance saying, quote, and I took that personally. Schwartz had this to say about the alleged diss. Take a listen. If anybody wants to take um, offense to being compared to who I think is one of the greatest players in the history of the National Football League, then, uh, yeah, if, if you get your motivation that way, then, uh, then fine. But um, we're not going to worry too much about that. Mm, so, Greg, a little spicy mm. here. Whose side you're on in this feud, Metcalf or Schwartz? Man, I'm on Metcalf's side. If you're going to compare me, if you're going to give me the compliment, give me the full compliment, don't give me the backhand the compliment telling me I'm not there yet. I don't need to hear that part because after the game, I'm going to come and check in and see, am I there yet? Because mm. uh, I'm mm. balling. Yeah, when, mm. when, when, you, when you're a player and you've been playing well, the worst thing a coach can do, I don't care, any or a player can do, is come up and tell you where you aren't, the bar that you haven't gotten to yet. I'm, trust me, I may know that myself. I may know that very well to be true, but don't tell me that, especially right before I have an opportunity to impose my will, because that's exactly what we saw DK Metcalf do. He took exactly what Schwartz said, whether he meant it as a compliment or not. DK Metcalf used it like we've seen all great athletes do, and he used it to his benefit, and he took it out on every single player. We talk about don't give them bulletin board material. Well, he gave him bulletin board material right at the beginning of the game. Don't do that to me. You, you, you Look, his uh, DBs, uh, his DBs uh, are looking at him like, man, come on, coach, you did uh, that to me. 
Man, I've been defending wide receivers my whole career and kickers. I always say, like, no, kickers are part of the team and wide receivers aren't divas. But that explanation right there is why I'm with Jim Schwartz and, and y'all are some damn divas. Oh, we got to hide reality from y'all because it's almost kickoff time. Don't keep it real with a receiver right before kickoff and tell him you ain't Calvin Johnson. I don't even know if I believe that. That doesn't even make sense for him to say you're not Calvin Johnson because it's so damn obvious. No one in there, what, second year is Calvin damn Johnson. So why are you even taking that as a slight? This is why I didn't like that Jordan documentary. The Last Dance got this younger generation thinking, oh, if I make up something and act like it got me all mad and pissed off, you know what? They're going to think I'm a killer on the field. They're going to think I'm a killer off the court. And just lie, lie, lie. Just like Michael Jordan said, that was a lie as well. Just something that sounds good <laughs> in story. Man, you better miss me with that, DK. DK don't know. That's what DK stand for. Don't know what he's talking about right here. I'm with you, Schwartz. I mean, I don't even know why DK Metcalf is all upset because his game is nothing like Calvin Johnson's game. They're two completely different wideouts. Mm. Now, I'm starting with Jim Sports, but if I'm Jim Sports, you know who I'm mad at? I'm mad at Darius Slay. Because at Darius Slay, we paid you $17 million. You say yeah. you want to have a good sombrero and take DK Metcalf, Ooh. but then you can't let him go crazy Ooh. out there in one on one matchups. Got yeah. us looking all bad. And so I understand where DK Metcalf comes from. Because I understand the slight that he may perceive it to be. But, like, in reality, I mean, he's really not Calvin Johnson. <laughs> he's more T.O. than Calvin Johnson. Like, his game is not that. So, like, quit, quit being so sensitive. I mean, he just said, he said you're a good player. I mean, come on, bro. Let it go. Mm-hmm. That's what happens, Greg. Greg know his type. Greg know his kind. That's how his people roll. They are wow. soft. S-O-F-F-F. -F -F. Soft. You can't tell somebody who you are. Somebody walk up to me and say, you're not Bruce Smith. I'm like, you're damn right I ain't Bruce Smith. But this Marcel's Wiley looking kind of good, ain't he, coach? Man, Jim Schwartz just broke it down and kept it real with him. Sorry, DK can't take the truth. Move on, young man. Move on.